Hi there. This is my commentary on Chapter 20 of Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert M. Persick. I hope the sound is okay. I can't find my microphone. <laughs> so in the aftermath of a visit from his famous guest, Robert Redford, Phaedrus goes through his customary thought process, which we've seen throughout the book. And this is largely focused on the ongoing immersion and development of his metaphysics, which really is what the book is about. And this is sometimes in a lecture form and sometimes with examples. So this is an example-heavy chapter, which is a real pleasure to read, even though it's not exactly a positive chapter. In this chapter, he reflects on the meaning of the visit with, Re uh, with Redford and the implications for making Zinn in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance into a movie. And he draws richly from the development over the previous chapters with numerous examples to illustrate what's going through his head. Also in this chapter is and this is important, is an exploration of how the social level operates. And the characters, remember, um, I think we've already, I think I already mentioned this, Phaedrus, Regal, and Lila represent three ways of existing in the social level, three ways of engaging with the social level. Each evolutionary level is organized around a dynamic principle or a set of dynamic principles. These dynamic principles keep the thing running, keep the thing growing, keep the thing evolving. You need dynamism to evolve. So as the biological level is more or less organized around sex, the social level is more or less organized around hierarchy. There may be some people who object to that, but um, I, think it's, <laughs> I think when you're actually living in the social level, it's pretty obvious. And so hierarchy is another way of saying celebrity or vice versa. So he goes into celebrity in depth because it's important. And a rationalist, for example, might discount the effect of the social level, think it can be explained away, which in fact rationalists always try to do, or frequently try to do, which is one of the problems that this book addresses. Or a rationalist will say celebrity doesn't matter, and yet at the same time will certainly goon out if they're in the presence of someone like, like um, Redford, so it does not exist intellectually, but people act it out all the time, even if they think it doesn't exist. So as the chapter opens, he senses the ghost of Redford, which is still in the room after Redford is left, in the, you know, the empty chair. You look at the empty chair, and the fact that this presence remains is notable. There's a value pattern of a sort, a social value pattern of this, of this ghost, and it's a ghost directly after anyone leaves, but we feel it more if it's someone higher on the hierarchy or someone with a big personality, someone who's threatening, you know, or, or someone who really made you feel good. If, they, if, there's an, if there's an emotional impact of the person who was just in the room, if they affected you in some way when they leave, you still feel the presence, and it's very real. He goes back to the balcony, and there's a staleness of the once spectacular view. It seems you pay a lot of money for that view for the initial dynamic thrill, which wears off real quick. It's still beautiful, but not emotionally engaging in the same way that it was in the first few moments. And that will remind you of a few chapters back where he was he was explaining this to us with a great example of a song that you heard for the first time that is so good you can't stand it. You have to find it. You, you know, back then it would have been a lot more difficult. <laughs> You'd have to really dig around in the record shops or, um, you know, to try to figure out what it was if you heard it on the radio. Nowadays, you just hold up your phone to uh, wherever you hear it playing and it'll tell you what it is. So there's, there's something missing in that. So the view is still beautiful, but not emotionally gauging it the same way at all. So what he does is he kind of, he kind of um, capitalizes on the height of the balcony, which is still thrilling because if you look over, you know, you're, if you have a fear of heights, and most people are going to have some kind of a fear of heights if they're high enough, that threat to your safety will always, will always uh, be dynamic. And in conjunction with the storm, the fact that the wind is now vertical is causing this new kind of dynamic spectacle due to this height. For some reason, he's unengaged emotionally. He feels like the, the primal, the primal unsettledness, the fear, the anxiety, but he doesn't feel himself in this. Disconnected, all this seemed to be happening to somebody else. 
There was excitement of a kind, tension, confusion, but no real emotional involvement. He felt like some galvanometer that had been zapped, and now the needle was jammed, stuck, unable to register. So it's like he's describing some kind of mild, anxious dissociation. And that's kind of what happens after a semi-traumatic event, which is there is something, then this, this goes into the importance of the social level. There is something traumatic after you leave a social encounter, which you didn't think went well. You know, it's that feeling like maybe I'm going to, probably this dissociation is, oh no, I've screwed up and now I'm going to be ejected. It's some variation of that. Ultimately, it's, it's kind of feels like a splitting of self. You have the self that you feel like you are, your personal self, the, the self that you embody, and then there's your social self. And when you, we feel like these are out of whack, dissociation makes sense. It is kind of a, I hate to use the, overuse the word trauma, but if you look at the word trauma in terms of a spectrum, you know it's the same pathway, let's say. And so he has this unsettled feeling. There was something wrong, something wrong, something wrong feeling, like a buzzer in the back of his mind. It wasn't just his imagination. It was real. It was a primary perception of negative quality. First you sense the high or low quality, then you find reasons for it, not the other way around. This is a great description of the experience of how we perceive quality and then slot it, try to slot it into a pattern, a previous pattern that we can understand. He's having a difficult time doing that because this isn't feeling quite right, you know. He feels like he should feel good about it but there's something wrong, and he can't quite put his finger on it. Quality, positive or negative, definitely has this feeling tone that he describes, but quality doesn't have to look any one way. There isn't really a set of rules that tells you what's, what's good or what's not. I mean, they may exist for periods of time, but ultimately quality is something that um, updates in the moment, and it, and it it plays off of previous patterns, so there'll be a similarity. But quality, you know, how it, how it manifests in the world evolves. Quality is metaphysical, which means you have to align with the way things are rather than reaching for a set outcome that you already think is, is high quality. This is Regal's problem. If you resist change because you have this preconceived notion about the way things are going to be, you're going to have a problem. You're going to be like Regal. You're going to be stuck. And in that case, you kind of have to follow that voice rather than push that voice, that low quality voice aside. You have to follow it. It's telling you something isn't right. And the rest of the chapter is him following this voice. Peters feels a lot of conflict in this chapter. You don't have to go into really so much the queasy feeling he feels about the film business. That's sort of a trope. We know it's kind of sleazy business, even though you have a very unsleazy act, actor, uh, both an actor of business and an act, a regular actor in Redford. But it does inspire a lot of internal conflict for reasons he's not sure at the time, as we said. And this dis-ease begins with that sign of low quality stagnation, that lack of freshness, the feeling that something is is too set in stone, too rigid. And after the dynamic dazzle of Redford himself, in retrospect, what comes out of Redford's mouth is all is really ultimately all business, um, with some reluctance on Redford's part, because I think Redford, a very smart guy, he knows kind of what the problem is. Nonetheless, his agenda agenda is to make this film. Fame might have something to do with this unsettledness. Redford is famous, but Persig was too. And you could argue that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is almost as recognizable a title, if not as recognizable, as when I say Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Same when I say Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I would say that those two titles um, are on par. The division of self is obvious in that sense because he points out that at one time he was on the bottom and now he's on the top of the social level. Someone who a few short years before 
he was the toast of the literary world in the early 70s, was at rock bottom of that level in the early 60s, having been hauled off to the psych ward after peeing on himself for three days straight in cat a catatonic dissociation. The fact he's conflicted is not surprising, and as I've remarked before, most, um, most mental distress has its origin in the social level. And his distress was having been kicked out of the social level, of having lost his mind. And he refers to this in ways we've heard before. He refers to the social level, and he refers to this force that can accept you or reject you, the giant, the gods. These control him and all of us. These are the mythological beings that represent the requirements and the judgments to be able to stay in society. So you fall into their disfavor, you fall out of favor with them, and you're out. Fame itself is part of this conflict. The fact that this mild-mannered, once mentally ill Montana professor is finally, after many years, being eyed by attractive young ladies and being, you know, they attempt to seduce him, is really, you know, had, had been really jarring for him because all these years, no, no one, you know, women really didn't look at him twice. And once he's famous, there he is. And he calls this, this dichotomy the Zen hell. But as we've seen in this book, psychological trauma and chaos are visited over and over again. And this, uh, with, with him and with Lila, this is a sub-theme of the book, is, you know, mental illness, what it means. And his description of Zen hell evokes this torment as well. And we could call this, and I think he kind of alludes to this, what the Buddhists would call the realm of the hungry ghosts. He wasn't talking about anything Dante would have identified. Dante's Christian hell is an afterlife of eternal torment, but Zen hell is this world right here and now, in which you see life around you, but you can't participate in it. You're forever a stranger from your own life because there's something in your life that holds you back. You see others bathing in life all around them, while you have to drink it through a straw, never getting enough. I think it's important to remember that both these hells, regular Dante's regular Christian hell and the Zen hell, are characterized by the nature of entrapment. There you are, aware that there's something dynamic that could take you out of this, but you absolutely cannot ex access it. And that is certainly describes, for example, major depression. You see how you're supposed to feel. You see other people around you who are acting happy or acting engaged or getting into life or part of life, but you're stuck in this hell of not being able to feel anything. Or if you do feel something, it's negative, it's pain, it's low quality. And that, that pain or that nihilism or that low quality or that uh, lack of engagement keeps you trapped because it won't let you evoke the dynamic desire for to consider treatment. Or it makes them just seem like gray, false hope that, you know, that why bother with these treatments because they're not going to work anyway. As usual, nature plays its part. The swirling storm, the vertical wind, the fluttering moth all illustrate this, chaos, this chaotic, fragmented inner state. Persig is a master of using what's happening in the environment to illustrate what's happening in the shiitake, what's happening in the philosophy, what's happening in the inner dialogue. And natural observations themselves that he makes, you can, you can easily associate superficially, but a lot of times you dig down deeper and deeper into these, in these observations of the nature around or the happenings around, and you can see how they're related throughout the book. In Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, there was always it was always going back to the mountain and it was always it was always the sun was either present or absent and often how they were feeling had to do with whether it was sunny or whether they were in shadow in so you've got let's just say Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance the elements are fire and water uh, fire and earth and lila the elements are air and water there's always a storm or you know, you're hoping for calm, but everything is, is the, the natural observations tend around wind and water, storms, waves, and that kind of thing. 
Um, also, I want to make another contrast. In Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the, tra the trajectory was toward integration. Here, in this book, it appears to be towards fragmentation, his own fragmentation, Lila's obvious declining mental state. They're both kind of, the trajectory is towards not so good. You know, the, the tumult of wind and water and rocking of the boat and these storms versus the smooth sailing on the motorcycle in the sunshine. So these are very different novels, structured. There's a lot of similarity in the structure, but they're quite different. Since he's mulling over his identity, and again, this is a social identity, he takes stock of how the other characters interpret that identity, and it's different depending on who they are, where they're coming from socially. To loose biological Lila, he's an uptight nerd. To the rigid Victorian Brigel, Phaedrus is a reckless purveyor of dangerous ideas, and this is demonstrated by his reckless involvement with that sewer lady, Lila. It's projection, of course, depending on what rankles the person the most. And this is often what they fear most in themselves, what they hate most in themselves, or like the hungry ghost, what, they, what they'd like to have uh, unconsciously but can't. There's always a feeling of negativity towards yourself in anything you project towards someone else. And if you think about that, you'll, you'll probably agree with me. Each person you come to is a different mirror. And since you're just another person like them, maybe you're just another mirror too. And there's no way of ever knowing whether your own view of yourself is just another distortion. Maybe all you ever see is reflections. Maybe mirrors are all you ever get. First the mirrors of your parents, then friends and teachers, then bosses and officials, priests and ministers, and maybe writers and painters too. That's their job too, holding up mirrors. But this is more than a description of a psychological defense. This is getting to the gist of who we are and who we are uh, primarily is what another person thinks you are, or not primarily, but wh what another person thinks you are and what they're reflecting back to you very much establishes your identity, at least your persona. And it has to be for society to stick together. This is a pattern in society that is kind of required for us to stick together. You have to encourage the agreed upon good and discourage the bad and your mythos is going to kind of dictate that to you. You, you. you may be able to analyze it intellectually, but this comes from a feeling. This comes from the feeling of social quality. And the importance of this can't be discounted, which brings to mind something I've started to notice and that I've already mentioned. Much of this book is demonstrating the importance of the social level, and this may be aimed at the intellectuals and philosophy students that like Persig but might be inclined to live in the rationalist space. I'm not saying this is what it is, but these are the people who would likely read Persig. They would be a group of people, intellectuals, who tend to discount the, the reality of the social. And they may not be inclined to see the actuality of the social value all the while acting in society as if these patterns are real. We all do this. This is what Jonathan Pajot means when he says science is nested in religion. Our values, our morality comes from the social level. You can't do science without morals. If you do it from, prim from a purely intellectual standpoint, then what's to stop a scientist from crossing Ebola with smallpox and spreading it just to see what happens? You're also going to see this in a lot of the political stuff that's happening on both sides. There's an intellectual idea or a narrative that's formulated intellectually and that's enforced top down on people and depending on what they're looking at they believe it and then they think that society is structured this way they try to act like it's structured in that way it's not structured in that way and then there's a big shit show and that's what we're seeing right now but in the end the metaphysics of quality um, says that the intellectual is the highest and most evolved level and it is the highest level, it has to stay dynamic. The example I just gave of the two narratives are, st are static, um, undynamic narratives and forced top down. There has to be a back and forth exchange between the intellectual and social for it to possibly work. But ultimately, the intellectual level, if it's flexible, is the highest level of evolution. So, as he ends the book, that influences the decision he finally makes regarding making this movie. But what he saw at this point 
was a social pattern of values, a film devouring an intellectual pattern of values, his book. It would be a lower form of life feeding on a higher form of life. As such, it would be immoral. And that's exactly how it felt, immoral. That's what had produced all these something wrong, something wrong, something wrong feelings. The mirrors were trying to take over the truth. They think that because they pay you money, which is a social form of gratification, they are entitled to do as they please with the intellectual truth of the book. Uh-uh. Those gods, they'll pull anything. And thus the dis-ease when it comes to selling out and all the intellectual justification He's trying to counter it, but it ultimately it is selling out. It is selling his intellectual idea for money, and he's not going to do it. And there are times when Persig's moral system seems ambiguous, and other times it's as clear as day. Right here, it's clear as day. My guess is partially because intellectually Phaedrus believed so much in his book and his, in his message. He wanted to convey that message to the world, and intellectually the best way to do that is through a film. But there was something else that made him wanted to do it too. Something else that made him want to bring this book into the world of Redford. There was something so compelling about Redford's celebrity status that for a while his decision making was really outside the realm of his intellectual control. The social dynamism of celebrity overtook him the same way Lila seduced him by evoking his biological self. But ultimately at least in the case of the film, the higher level prevailed, and I think most of us are grateful for that. So I hope that made sense, and I'll see you next time.